So, Chloe, we're surrounded by your paintings. I think this is Tiger Hill. Yes, correct? yes, that a is. A specific place or because of the stripes? Oh, it's, it's a place um, in my mind, uh -huh. but I think, um, yes, there's definitely like a form, but it it's resembles a tiger. It's yes. also um, mountainous. I think I like to kind of put that amb ambiguity there where you're not sure if it's a landscape or a, a figurative being. Um, or you can also view it in a very abstract way at the same time. But I think ultimately it's like how we relate to nature and sort of how tigers and mountain, mountains have the same imposing sort of magnificence, right? Yeah, that you know they become symbols that represent to us like <clears throat> something like transcendent, right? Or something that is, that is the, the power of nature. Yes. Um, yeah, and it's, it's nice, the texture of the fur comes through. Yes, the fuzziness. Yes, yes, I, yes. I think that's the interesting thing about felines. They kind of have this, this, this allure where they're beautiful and you want to touch them. They're, they're very supple. And, and uh, yet, at the same time, yes, how do you get that sensation of texture with yes. ink, right, and the color? I use coffee for this. Well, I, wanted, so. I wanted to ask you about that with the range of media you use. Mm -hmm. So it's quite diverse. You use coffee, ink, acrylic, then in some of your drawings, chalk, pastel. Yes, yes, and yes, so a lot. <laughs> tell, tell me what leads you to use so, so much different uh, media. Um, well, I think each media, each medium kind of creates a different effect. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can't really express a certain uh, sensation or a certain kind of, of uh, texture or, or um, you can't really define something without using a different medium for, to, to express that effect. For, for example, like if I use spray paint, mm -hmm. it, it, I think better than other mediums expresses something kind of ethereal, something airy. Yes. If you want a kind of a cloud or mist texture, mm -hmm. you, you can use that in a, in a much more effective way than you could like say uh, charcoal or, or even ink, you know? So uh, it seems to make sense to me because when I was growing up, I used both mediums. I was learning both mediums at the same time, Chinese ink and also I was taking art classes at school. So it, it just made sense to me to kind of combine them. I didn't really see any distinct separation. It was only about what best served the image yes, or, yes, or, or what kind of emotion you want to bring out. Because it's, like com it's like comparing it to instruments. Like if with a violin, you can get great specificity and sort of um, uh, very fragile and very um, delicate notes. Whereas with a drum, you get that power, you get that, that real, that sense of heaviness and the, and the impact of sound. So I, I feel like each medium is like, if you combine it in a musical sense, you have some, some like the blackness of ink is great for, for punctuating certain um, tones and, and even the paper itself becomes the medium, right? Because the, the absence, right? The, the whiteness of the paper or the texture of the paper becomes so much a part of the, of the overall composition at the same time. Um, but I think I just, I also I just enjoy using all those mediums and I, I'd hate to have to pick just one. Um, I, I feel too, it, it kind of is, is a bit unexpected. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when people kind of learn, oh, you, you used spray paint and, and ink or you used charcoal and ink, it's if people kind of are surprised and it's that, that element of the unexpected that I think, you know, also, um, you know, or people have to try and figure it out. Like, how do you create yeah, that? Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, so tell me what led you to use coffee. You and I are both coffee drinkers. Yes, co so. I get co I'm a coffee addict. Yes. I, I, okay, so what, tell me about your early experiments in using coffee. Oh, well, first of all, I think what, and just in a very kind of like, I guess, <laughs> a basic kind of an interesting way, uh, I was always drinking coffee while I was yes. working oh. just because I needed it. Yes. I needed the, the kind of the, uh, the uh, was it amphetamine? <laughs> the, the, yeah, the adrenaline, the, the sheer. I mean, of course, it goes so much the other way that you just be kind of like a quivering, quivering wreck. But, but I think also what I found with it is that it just something about it was so appealing. The color of it, the smell, 
The Do, does that depend on how you brew it in terms of the strength? Yes, the and yeah, exactly. Like the, the, the more intense the coffee, the, the deeper the color, and also the temperature of it even can change. Oh. For example, if, if, a cof if the coffee is very hot, mm -hmm. it tends to diffuse more. Whereas yes. if it's cold, if you put it in the fridge, then oh, it, yes, it, yes. It, it's, it changes the, the viscosity of it and how it mixes with ink. Sure, sure. But I just I couldn't find the right brown that I, in, in terms of like the, the store-bought inks and mixing yes. it, I just could never get the right brown until I, I, I was looking at the coffee and then I just said, aha, like I, I want this color, so why not just use, just use it? It's non-toxic, sure. it, it looks, it combines well, and it, uh, it kind of adds something unexpected. I've known other artists that use tea, yes, I think. I was just gonna ask you <laughs> I just, I like coffee more. I'm a coffee drinker, so the, the coffee one, yes, it's available. And, and um, also I just find there's, there's this, this, this uh, exciting uh, kind of chemistry aspect, yes, where it's like if you brew the stronger coffee, then yes. you, and also even the different, different kinds of coffee, you get different kinds of colors. Sure. Some of them are more reddish, some of them are more cool. Um, some of them are kind of more, um, the, the way it dries and reacts to the to the, so I, the I, rice these paper. So some of the technical challenges, I guess. Yeah. It means your experience with your with your medium and, and your knowledge of the medium and like this this uh, work over here is a beautiful beige tone. Yes. Much like your dress. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I I dress to match. I dress to match. Actually, yes. I think also I I feel like. Certain colors, like I'm very interested in color theory. So they say something about brown being the color of, of obviously kind of immediately lends itself to nature and, and its trustworthiness. Okay. And, and, and sort of, yes, grounded on, and they said something to the effect that if, if, you, if you wear certain colors, they kind of connote certain, certain um, uh, messages or, or, or what you want to express, right? So I think the same thing with art. I feel like the brown too, it, people instantly feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. There's something about it that's very pleasing to the pressure, eye. Right? Yes. But you, you've also done a, a large number of works using blue. Yes. Now is that indigo or what, what is the blue that you use? Oh wow, uh, I, was, I really love, I just love all these questions. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I, I try and use a very kind of bright, um, I would say, um, uh, what is it like a um, uh, what's the word I, I had it and now it's, it's gone but uh, yes kind of a bright electric electric blue mm -hmm. something that's very much um, energizing because it's, blue can be very calming at the same time it's tranquil and and I think something about like the 60% of the world's favorite color is blue yes, yes. so knowing this I think immediately you know people will, will relate to it in a positive way so I think those two colors the brown and the blue for example like the one right near you kind of has a spot of blue yes, yes. because it, it also lends it it, it it just immediately reminds people of nature and something even about physiology I think um, we're, I think, for example, that we're wearing, you know, red lipstick. Red immediately, the eye goes to red instantly, yes. right? Is also a kind of a tr it's an arousal color. It immediately heightens people's appetites. It's also a color of like danger and confidence and boldness, Passion. right? Passion, yes, exactly, exactly, <laughs> yes. Fire, all these and, and warmth. Um, it, I think blue. They said. I, I've, I've read this book that's just to the effect that evolutionary biology says that, that people are attracted to blue things because they, they um, are looking for water, water yes. sources, yes. and blue yes. skies mean safety. There's no clouds, there's no, so, yes. so, so, so even unconsciously, it's like, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, and some of your series with blue are actually fish related. Yes, yes, yes. I now thought of the word cobalt blue. Oh, cobalt okay. blue. That took me a long time to uh -oh. think of think of the word. Um, usually, I use the hue though because cobalt is very toxic. But so. and cobalt's a mineral, whereas say indigo is a vegetable. Yes, oh, exactly. So. And indigo too. I think that's it's known as it's kind of people use the term indigo for an intu intuition, like an indigo child or indigo. Yeah, like indi it's it's supposed to kind of be a very tranquil color as well, and something that's about wisdom, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think when I'm using those colors, I'm trying to use those as like a shorthand mm -hmm. to to um, knowing kind of what people generally are, relate to. But um, 
in your references about color theory, it sounds to me that you're referring mostly to Western. Yes. But have you explored the more Asian approach, the feng shui aspects of color? Yeah, uh, for sure. Like, for example, just the use of red. Um, I, I definitely think, you know, that color is, is something that, um, to me, is, is, is very much about happiness mm -hmm. and, and about kind of a, a experience of, yes, of life. Yes. And also white is sort of a more negative color. Yeah. Is, is it? Morning. Yes, yes, an absence, right? Yes. And, and so I think white to me also kind of has that, the same thing as black. I don't, I don't see black as a negative color at all. I see it, you know what I mean? Some, there's some I people. Know, I always wear black. Uh, no, because but black is all color, right? Black is yes. black is, is 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 one of the 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 most rich of colors, I think. And yes. and and the fact that Chinese ink is black yes. and it's and sure. it's the most beautiful and and, and uh, I think kind of the ultimately everything is centered around it. You know, N nothing else can can exist without that anchoring. I think black is is very anchoring and and. Uh, very much um, essential to like how I, I see art, you know, how I see, and I think that's primarily why I was always drawn to ink because of the blackness, you know, it, it provided the perfect counterpoint to anything else. It goes with every color, like I can't think of one color, it doesn't, it doesn't enhance, it, because it's beautiful and it's in its own, its own right. So I think, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely think in terms of, of Chinese kind of the, the, the Eastern association with color, um, it, it's very much part of my work too. I think it's, it, if you use both of them, right? Um, although it's hard to it's hard separate the two now because I think now so much of, so much of, of how we see color has been influenced by, by each. By oh, color, agreed, kind of agreed by both, sure. Color, right? well, I wanted to ask you, in addition to challenge of different mediums. Right. Uh, I know in your current show, you have 3D printing. Mm -hmm. how, how, when did you start exploring that? Oh, well, um, it's something I've, I've wanted to do. I've always wanted to kind of take an ink painting and, and, and make it a three-dimensional sort mm -hmm. of um, painting. Uh, but I think one part of it is that as an artist, your art form, of course, changes or, or it can be expanded by the, you know, the advancement of technology. So I think, you know, one, one aspect of an artist is to reflect the times, right? Um, and, and I think, you know, clearly, like, for example, in, in the Renaissance, like, there wasn't really much blue pigment, you know, until, until that was discovered that changed everything, you know, or, or even like, yeah, like a Titian's red, like, I think your, your medium sort of expands with, with, with growth of certain um, opportunities? Yes, of opportunities, and, and, and there's there's new uh, you have your imagination kind of kind of uh, just expands with with the with the use of new, new technologies. So um, part of the 3D kind of printing was that I wanted to kind of take something that was two dimensional and create like this this very lifelike as lifelike as possible. Um, that, you know, in, in the accuracy, which I'm not sure you could do at least my level of skill to, to, to create, mm -hmm. and that what if you were very literal with it? Like if you actually just took your drawing and scanned it, how would a machine interpret it? And it's still your thought process, yes. but it's, it's being kind of translated through this, this other medium. Yes. And of course you can like adjust it if you have, if you have other specifications. But I, I really wanted to experiment and see what, if it could, if a machine could create a response, you know, from, from an original artwork, if it, if it could uh, express like an artist's idea, right? And are you, on the whole, are you satisfied? I think, I was, I think, I think yes, particularly in, you know, the, the, the human portraits, because I think for that, um, I had no idea at the sophistication that it could it could really read every like line and, and drawn aspect right 
Um, and I think, too, uh, 3D technologies have this very revolutionary potential where they, they have, for example, people using it to create like, false limbs or, 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 or design certain things. Um, so I, I had never really heard of a 3D technology applied to, to art making. I mean, there was like clothes making, but I, I hadn't heard of that. So I, I was very surprised and I was, I was, I was also, um, I recognized my art in there. Too. Oh, so so I, that, that sounds a bit satisfactory than the outcome. Yes, and yes. You know, in particular, I'm thinking of one of your portraits, and it's it's whole, but it's fragmentary because there are holes in it. Right. And so immediately that leads us to some of your other portraits. Right. That, that are have an enigmatic quality to it, mm -hmm. which in turn leads to thinking of some Western artists like Francis Bacon. Yeah. Who's one of our favorites? Yes, our faves. Yes. So, what, <laughs> what is it about Francis Bacon's art that appeals to you? Uh, I, it's strange. I mean, in my studio, um, I have two things on my wall besides art. I have a cross, and then I have a picture of Francis Bacon. Oh. And I feel like Francis Bacon was very much like a patron saint. Yes. In, in terms of like what I thought art was about, mm -hmm. and and what what good art does. Um, and I think what he represented to me was this really unfiltered, uh, completely um, original and, and this raw kind of use of art to kind of, com um, to completely kind of dismantle people's mm -hmm. preconceptions. Yes, and what, what portraiture is. Yes. Oh, definitely. I think it, it was such a revolutionary. Yeah. And, and, and also just the amount of the, the dedication he had to his work um, and what he did with his work because he was quite anti-narrative and he, he kind of wanted to affect people on a visceral sensory nerve level like a, like a shock to the nervous system. So I think that's really what I, I, I connected with that aim. I felt like you want art that makes people stop and say, whoa, you know, and not be able to walk past it and something about it that's, that's extremely magnetic and intense. And his, the way he fragments people's faces, I think, you know, really sp speaks to people in a, in a sense that even if they can't, they, they don't really understand, they, they can see, you know, I think, for example, he was trying to capture what it's like to be that person in within and in, from an internal sense it's not just you know completely or it or a sense of a moving image right um so for me it would, i think ink too has that ability to to represent the fluidity of like you know our sensory perception and our ideas of self and well, kind it's of very, it's very direct yes in the sense that because it's permanent Mistakes cannot be changed, right? And also the beauty of the impulse and the movement and the energy. Is, right. Is it, I, the word you use, visceral, very much strikes a chord. Yeah. It's very visceral. And yeah, just also how he how he drew people that he knew. I, I think too that it, it kind of. He, he used his, like usually his models were people he was close to or yes. his, or his uh, lovers. And, and also he, he did it in such a way that really there was this real sense of mystery about it. And even though he was, he was quite open with his work, there was always this sense of, with, of withholding, which I thought was really interesting. Like, and, and it made it very, that's why you, you look at the work and you continuously look at it and you're trying to find something and it's what it is, is sort of ineffable, right? And, and, it, and I think also the idea of seeing through it past someone's face, yes, into the I face. Agree, agree. And I think that's also why some people are really uncomfortable with it. Yes. Because it's incomplete. Yes. It's, his studio, by the way, is amazing. Have you, have you been to see it? No, it's but... It's in uh, Dublin. Really? It's wonderful. Oh, gosh. It's just such an amazing mess. It's the floor... They, the, um, it's in Dublin, and it was taken from London and recreated there. It's totally accurate. That's fantastic. And it's really, it's definitely a pilgrimage site for anybody. I heard he used to use the palette on the wall, oh. like he used to paint on his wall as oh, this. And the floor is covered with <laughs> uh, paint tubes and paper and all kinds of things. Well, it makes me better, makes me feel better about my studio, <laughs> for sure, <laughs> really. Maybe you should have a picture of his studio. I know, I would, so. yeah. I mean, because the name Mount Olympia, it sounds kind of like a purient joke. I mean, because it's, it's, it was 
a mountain, but a, you know, Mount, oh, never mind. <laughs> Mount Olympia, yes. Yes, a little bit like Tiger Mountain. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. yes. That it's both a landscape and a and a figure and yes. um, and, and an abstraction. Yes. So I, I think yeah, in the same way that you know Francis Bacon took a lot of a lot of uh, kind of famous ideas and, and depicted them in a very in a very kind of um, deconstructed way. Yes. I think that's what Monet was doing with yes. with Olympia and the, the, the uh, Venus of Urbino, Ur with the Titian, sure. the Titian one. And I think what he did was completely. Um, it was like a complete um, kind of, I believe, upsetting of the apple cart of the oh, nude. Yeah. yeah. It was so startling the way her her eye face, contact. Her eyes, yes. And the and directness. Demands, yes. So the viewer too. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and yeah. and um, just also the way her nudity is displayed, and I think the idea that the nude wasn't only about the, the naked, usually female body. Mm -hmm. um, it was a perception of, a perception of how a, a, a nude fe of a naked woman, right? And it was a stylized sort of repertoire of poses yes. that were meant to be very much about um, kind of an ideological like ownership, owner object yes. relationship to, to to the female body um, and and also the idea that uh, the idealism of the goddess gives way to the realism of the of the prostituted woman right yes. so I mean for me exactly. yes and, and exactly like the the word Olympia was used very like as also a, a sort of a, I would I wouldn't say a joke but in a way it was because it was very much clear that this woman was waiting for for a customer. a customer, yes, yes, and and the frankness, right, and and it's very much um, was was forbidden to to it kind of admit where when women are kind of objectified in that way, that ultimately it's a, it's yes. a commodification of of that form. Um, so for for that piece in particular, Mount Olympia, I was doing a, a piece for Olivia Putnam who was doing a salon, mm -hmm. and my idea was to do a piece that reflected the ideals of the salon, mm -hmm. which you know what goes behind. She had this beautiful um, piece that was like a like an art piece of a sofa that looked like a crescent moon, oh. and I was like, what's the whole idea of the sofa art in the salon? Yes, it was like yes. either a, a female nude or a landscape. Yes, or um, and a, a sort of a uh, a. Uh, De decorative um, ab abstract. So I thought, why not combine all three? Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. which, in one one respect, it looks, it resembles a nude, and another, it, it could be a landscape. Yeah, or it could definitely. Be nothing. Probably. So it, it, for me, it's reconciling all those art forms that it's not wholly abstract, it's not wholly figurative, or it's not uh, completely a landscape. It's, it can be all of those things. Well, in that, in that respect, uh, when I look at them, I find they're quite liberating because it is the female form. Yes. Definitely. One yeah. can identify uh, the female, <laughs> yes. female form. Uh, and yet it could also function in a very abstract way as a landscape. So I think it frees yes. the nude in a way in a way that's very pleasing. Right. And also it's about how you see it. And I think sure. that's it's very it's it's important to me not to prescribe ways of looking yes. you yes. know and that if you see a landscape that's all you see i'm not yes. going to tell you to to see something else and i think also the you know to me there's always a lot to to go into like the whole woman nature dichotomy right. like okay. the whole the yes. idea that women are associated with nature and then with culture and history and well and, and that can't be true no exactly <laughs> yeah i true. don't think it's, it's true but certainly like, I know there's Yes, yeah, but, but historically so, in our history, that's kind of been the case. Yes, we have yes. like woman neighbors frolicking around in of nature, course, and, of course. and and it's a very mm. the idea that women kind of um, embody that. Well, know? even going to say to Botticelli. Yes, yes, exactly. Like coming out of the ocean, yeah, right? right? And right. and uh, you know even uh, Matisse's bathers, yes, or yes. like you know the whole idea that that women uh, are this other race of like of. Of that they represent this mysterious, irrational, and in my well, I would say we are kind of special. I think so. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, we are pretty special. I must say, but you know, it, it's still. What I think what the art does, I mean, is is to is to examine those assumptions, yes. right? Yes. And and why do we have those assumptions? And and um, and how did it become that way? And, well, uh, you at Mills College, yes, you I did. With I Moira Roth. Yes, yes, I uh, did. So, so tell me about that. She's such a well-known figure in the in the world of feminist studies. Yes, yes. So has, does that 
the learning from her, did that impress upon you a feminist view? Yes, I, I think like um, studying with Moira was a great privilege. She's a, she's a wonderful lady. I mean, I remember going to her house and she had just met me and she's just invited her students over. Mm -hmm. she's, she's very, um, very inviting and warm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she had her place was covered in fans and she had, she had such an incredibly um, personal rapport with a lot of artists. And, and mm -hmm. through her, I got to know a lot of artists that, that, are, that have reached this, uh, this sort of reverential status, like yes. Faith Ringgold, uh, Bernice Bing, um, just so many artists, Judy Chicago, like all these yes. uh, the feminist artists that she, she was friends with and, and, and studied. And she also wrote this great essay called The Aesthetic of Indifference about abstract art, artists. Um, and that's like one of my favorite essays. Um, but Moira Roth, yes, definitely feminine, reading art from a feminist perspective, like art history or studying art from a feminist perspective, really um, allowed me to under, to kind of critically and and, and like analyze art making mm -hmm. and, and where I am in position to the art world yes. or, or to art in general. Like how, and I, th I consider myself a, a feminist artist. Um, you know, I'm very, I'm very happy and proud to be one yes. because I, I feel like a, many, a great deal, many of women artists are not uh, appreciated as much as they could be or are erased. Um, I think, you know, too, there's this, there is this sort of, sort of idea that you know, you're not supposed to say you're a woman artist, you know, you're supposed to say, I'm just an artist. And I, I take issue with that because I feel though, it, I understand why certain women artists do that. I feel like it's to, to mitigate the effects of sexism, to, to try and... Yes, and, and basically they're, they're saying, don't typify me as male or female Yes, artists. yes, yes, that, that my expression is beyond these sort of, I don't want to Gender, be, yes, yes co-opted yes. by, by, by stereotypes or... Or, um, or be marginalized because of it, or my work to be interpreted solely in one way. Um, but then again, I always feel like the problem with that is that it, it makes this, again, this assumption that being a woman is something that has to be transcended, you know, when it shouldn't, it shouldn't be, or that, you, that um, a sort of a masculine ideal is one you should aspire to, or that, a, or that of a kind of a, 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 a neutral, sexually neutral kind of, of person. Yes, yeah, so I think, you know, that's to me, and also just like even the writers that I, that, you know, um, I think like Andrea Dorkin wrote in Woman Hating, why did women, why have no women created, like, why have women not created great works of art? And I think that the answer was because women themselves are great works of art, which I thought was, uh, she's an amazing writer too, yes. very, it's hard to read because her, her work is so intense. But, but I think what she, she wrote, she was talking about like the importance of listening to voices that, that, that no one wants to and, and also kind of speaking for the voiceless. And I think um, you know, a lot of women artists that I, that I especially admire have, have, who have inspired me, like Eva Hess or, or any of them, um, it, it's because they, they constantly you know, um, looked at those barriers and assessed them and uh, expressed them, right? And, and I think that's what the true meaning of feminist art is, is to, for a woman to, to articulate the truth of her experience without resorting to, the, you know, what they say, the, the, you know, using kind of femininity as a, as a guise, or a, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, it's, of course it's there, but it, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need, it doesn't need to be conformed to that. It, it's just it's it has to be something that comes kind of completely naturally and not not about what people think a woman artist should do or should be like or or anything like that. Um, what was your going back to Mills College? Yes. What was your experience with Hong Liu, who is a contemporary Chinese painter, who yes. was also one of your teachers? Oh yeah, she she's also a great privilege to study under. Um, she had great swagger, great confidence, and um, this really no-nonsense um, attitude about art that I admired. And, and also, I, I felt like her work was very haunting. And it, it was about, you know, a memory and history and, and Chinese culture and um, kind of how parts of it become dis disconnected from anything else. I think also her technique was, was really, I went to her studio to watch her paint. 
and the way she, she applied it, you know, and the, and the layers and the amount so of... Could you explain more what sort of material she used and then her technique? Yes, she used oil painting, but she used it in such a way that I'm, I, I've never really seen anyone else use it. I mean, the, the thickness, but also she managed to get this very liquidy, inky effect with it. And also the fact that um, the, the, the background in the, in the foreground, that there's this sort of sense of, of depth, but yet of spacelessness at the same time. And that you know, her work has this kind of, this, this, this sort of almost, Lucian Ford rich like richness mm -hmm. in the in the figures and the also she um, her work often was very big and just you were confronted by it and I mean she also was very uh, she was very honest you know she she would always tell you what how to improve and how she really pushed me she pushed me as an artist yeah which is like what really what it's all about yes yes. But she, I think she was just a very much of a powerhouse of a painter, and yes, so so yes. just also wanting to impress her, and wanting to to kind of, um, you know. So I, I would Remember do. To excel. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. So as an example, I did like a ten foot painting just because I wanted her to notice me so badly. I just was yes. like, you pay attention, see what I'm doing, you know, and and uh, and yeah, she was just a wonderful person to to study with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you you went to Beijing. Uh, in more recent years, and you were you did an artist residency. Yes. In Wei Ligong's studio. Yes. Right? Yes. Could you comment about that and tell us more? Um, what the experience was like. Oh yeah, I think it was very spiritual. I think um, Wei Ligong. Um, s s studio has this sort of temple-like feeling to it, mm -hmm. and his work has this his this this kind of transcendent quality. Um, and seeing him at work too, I was 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 transformative for me. Um, I worked there from 2013 and it was an artist residency for about two weeks and I also went there in 2015 and, and later on in 2016 as well. Um, and I think too he, he taught me about abstraction really um, and how calligraphy his main focus is calligraphy, you know, and, and uh, he started his own calligraphy society and he's also very much and in, in the idea of the line, the beauty of the line, and that if you've mastered the line, you've mastered Chinese art, you mastered calligraphy. Um, I think also just um, his, his tutelage meant so much to me because I had admired his work for so long. Um, so with the fact that he invited me there, was, I was kind of uh, just completely uh, ecstatic to do that. And he's one of the most senior figures. Yes. In today's Yes, and he's very, he's very um, much a, I think, a representative of Chinese culture. Like he, he, what he does is is very important because he's he's about um, taking Chinese culture into a into an international, without an international stage, without diluting it, without changing its essence, with with also about. Um, Using that it, kind of the ancient is is actually modern. Like the yes. Chinese people actually invented abstract art. And also some of the uh, material he uses the text. Yes. Uh, this is Tao Te Ching and really classic yes. Chinese philosophy texts, which again are timeless. Yes. There's no need to dilute them. Yeah, and, and when you look at his work, it's so learned for that reason. There's yes. so much in it. There's poetry. Yeah, there's there's sure. yeah. And and there's and I think his work also has this this beauty and grandeur that it's kind of you know the like a, I I feel like once again it's power it has great power it has great um, it has great charisma yes. I think like like he does himself he I think he, he's very much when you look at his work and you look at him you're like of, you are your work you yes. know yeah so I, I yes I really appreciate his his uh, his uh, his tutelage and his friendship as well, yeah. Oh, great opportunity. Yes, and I think also through him, I think a lot of my work is, has been influenced by him. Um, you know, probably more than I can even consciously parse out. Um, but certainly, like some works for sure, like um, my multiverse works, it's the same idea, the one line. And in the line, there's, there's yes. infinite or an incredible amount of detail, you know, so. Um, and I think my work is it grows more abstract. I, I kind of understand more of the principles that, that govern his work or that 
he's trying to, um, he was trying to tell me, you know, through the work that, that slowly dawned, it, it kind of takes me a while. It takes me a while to fully understand, you know, to well, comprehend. I mean, with a tradition like that that has such depth, yes. it's, it's a lifelong learning experience. It, it is, yeah. And it's not something to be learned in one lesson. No, of course not. Generation. Yeah, or even, you know, a, a year or any, no, I think it, I, I'll spend much beyond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I think I'll be. <laughs> I think I'll be spending my whole life, honestly, you know, under understanding well, it's, it. It, it. It's so compelling and has such depth. Yes. That's why it is lifetime. So right. Exciting. Yeah. To think that there are all these opportunities ahead. To mm -hmm. do this. Yes. You you spoke about an aspect of his work about the poetry, and I know you're a great reader. So yes. Like, yes. Just commenting anything you're reading now, or a great book that you've read, or a poem. Does you have, for example, a series of of works that are figures from Shakespeare. Yes, yes. Yes. And how did that come about? Was it memories of Shakespeare, or uh, tell us about that? Uh, well, I, I started reading Shakespeare in, in school, as yeah. I guess all of us do. Has to. <laughs> yeah, of course. You're you're kind of like forced to like read this. Yes. But um, one thing that really caught me was the certain characters. That I, once you read Shakespeare, mm -hmm. it just becomes part of your like inner vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You start relating people to it, like you say, "Oh, how Hamlet like," or or, or, or oh, yes, 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 of course, or just certain Iago. yes, you know, or even you get called like you're an Iago. Like yes. it becomes part yes. of you know of how we how we can can comprehend people or articulate certain concepts that we have, or um, or even for example. Once you read certain things, you you can under, you can understand why they're so resonant right now. Mm -hmm. Like King Lear is a perfect kind of uh, encapsulation of a dysfunctional family and what happens when one child is favored over the other children, right? And and how and and kind of you're right. It, and or it, it makes a com or even the the comedies. There's there's great truth in or there's there's um there's so much humor in them because you know you see. You can still see parallels to now, and I couldn't really think of any other way to to instantly create that sense of connection, um, because everyone knows of Shakespeare. Even if you haven't read the plays, you know, like if you're called Romeo, what that means. If you're called, you know, um, something else, you, you immediately you can immediately kind of we have some basic understanding. So this kind of came out of like reading Shakespeare and then still having that within, and then encountering people and I would think, oh, that person reminds me of that character. So, so one of the first ones I did was Hamlet because my, my, uh, my oldest brother is very thoughtful mm -hmm. and very Hamlet-like. So I drew a portrait of him and I just named oh, it Hamlet. I didn't realize yeah, and there was a guy who towed my, towed my car when it broke down and he reminded me of Caliban just because of his body language and his size yes. and his kind of the way he kind of interacted with the car even. Mm -hmm. So it just became that, like it became about me having these experiences or meeting certain people that reminded me mm -hmm. of, of, of those, those characters because they, they, they so deeply kind of entered, entered into my, my inter, 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 how I interpreted. Those yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think Shakespeare too has a lot to say that, you know, it's kind of the idea of like Freud too using like the, the Greek myths, right? Yes, way to explain yes. Psychological <laughs> phenomena, like obviously, Oedipus complex, yes, or yes. Electra complex, or even just the word narcissism. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Greeks had it figured out. Like, mm -hmm. to, like the fact that they understood that concept of self-love, yes. and it's really love of your image, right? Yes. Not the not the real you. And it's in, incredibly uh, sophisticated. And and when you meet a true narcissist, <laughs> it's scary. Yes. Very frightening. Yes. Yes. And I think, have very little interest in other people. Oh, and exactly. Yes, and, yes. and also just you know the the fact that they that. This was already it, ever since we understood. Have been sure, around, sure. There, there, there's been these, these, these characters or these personalities yes. or these, these ways of regarding others and ourselves mm -hmm. that, like within the story, makes so much, so much sense. You know that 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 carry through. Mm -hmm. So I think with Shakespeare too, like when you look at some someone like um, that's it's very painful because they're human. It's like even even. You know, King Lear is, is very pitiful mm. because mm. You, can, you can kind of see, you know, why he behaved the way yes. he did. And yes. even though, you know, there's like a character like Othello too, like mm -hmm. what he does is inexcusable. Mm. But you understand the, the, the sense of like 
of, of these motivations mm-hmm. in you mm-hmm. to make you sympathize with people that you, that you otherwise would might just, not. Yeah, glorify <laughs> that. And I think that's what's it, it allows you to kind of understand, or even just the self awareness of Hamlet. Yes. Like the, sure. how painful self awareness mm-hmm. is, right? Mm-hmm. And just being um, conscious of. Um, your own existence, mm-hmm. right? Like the most kind of existentialism before existentialist, mm-hmm. right? Like the, this, it, it, it's in the Bible too, you see that as well. Like these, these moments where it, the, your characters sort of question, kind of unravel at the fabric of, of existence. Mm-hmm. And, you, and you, you're saying, well, okay, so this has been something that's, that's not just particular to our time. No, not at but all. This is something that we're always, going, we're always struggling with, mm-hmm. that we're always trying, and I think art deals with those concepts. Oh yes, right? very much. Um, and it has to, I yes. think, you know. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I think literature is very important. Oh, oh, books I'm reading now. Um, um, I'm reading this uh, Crowds in Power by Elias uh, Kennedy. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's a very interesting book about uh, crowd psychology. And oh. Kind of, uh, the madnesses of crowd and oh, crowd yes. behavior. Oh, um, yes. You know, there's... It's a whole a bunch of things that I'm, that I'm trying to trying to read and thinking about. But yeah, thinking about. Yes. Yeah, or even yes. just certain certain poems. Like I, you know, I love Wallace Stevens too. I think he's a he's a. Oh yes, yes. And I, I think also there's a lot of. I mean, there's so many. Like Frederico Garcia Lorca was another one I was really drawn to um, yes. because of just how he could ex- like. Um, express he often wrote poems from like inanimate objects perspective like the barren orange tree Mm -hmm. and talking about how you want the tree wants to be cut down because it will never bear fruit and so it's like i think someone described as the poet of longing Mm -hmm. and about the kind of thirst that everything has to to live and so when i when you start thinking that way like everything gets endowed with this sort of purpose and this real um like this real dignity, you know, and, and so that became very important, like when I was painting something living, I think that's, I often drawn to living things for that reason, you know, just even having like, like, like a, like a hamster or a cat, you watch it and you, there's something so miraculous about it, right? About yeah, right, about life itself in general, or even when you see certain people, you're like, this is astounding, like there are moments where, um, and I think that's, what I want with, with my art to do is kind of create that moment of, oh, where you, you're reminded or you, you can see life again, you know, not in this sort of resource driven way, but like in a way that you're truly just empathizing or appreciate or just even just um, studying it, yes. you know, yes. um, but there's a lot. I mean, there's so there's so many, so many writers, so many poets. Um, um, I'm reading a lot of Robin Morgan lately too, which is pretty in, in kind of. She wrote a poem called "Monster" about her relationship with her child and her husband, and how she feels about herself and her body being monstrous. Which I felt was like really, um, kind of also this struggle of how we how we conceive our bodies and how they're they're seen. And um, it, I think that may especially affect women. Yeah, yes. yeah, be, be feeling monstrous, right? Yes. Feeling uh, in, somehow uh, inhuman, you know, or just or somehow completely ill-fit for, mm-hmm. for something. I think that's another, an, another aspect of like what I, to, to get those, to get those, I think what I recognize in a lot of, of poets that I feel like there's something really irrepressible that's being said that, that's about how they've noticed something, like too, like you know, if you read like any Anne Sexton work or mm-hmm. Sylvia Plath, it, there's it's something very uh, jarring, you oh, know? Yes. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, and there's in this sense of like the the uh, the kind of the the agony of trying to express s- yes. something that is very much um, deeply kind of repressed because mm-hmm. you there's no really logical way to discuss it. No, and, and sometimes it's not very palatable. No, of course, right? And, and you know, it's, it's anything but, right? And so the, the, the poetry itself is an attempt to kind of dread, to 
dredge it out yes, from, from the depths. Yeah, and, and so there's certain different poets. Some poets are more like up here. Some, some yes. poets are more in at a, at a very deep base. I don't know, the up here base level doesn't sound very. But when, when we've been speaking about poetry, of course it draws on our deepest feelings and instincts and experience and so on. And what about the element of fun? What about when you're painting? How, how is that experience? <laughs> it can be great fun, honestly. <laughs> yes, yes, it's not, it's not all, it's not all, yeah, it's not, it's not all, it's not all, yes, it's not all it's, it's struggle and strife. It's, there, there's this real sense of, like, joy in, in, I hope this is not, yeah. There's, there's real joy in doing it. I think if, if there wasn't, an artist wouldn't, wouldn't be bound to create. Uh -huh. You know, I think, I think also, I think the, the issue is, is the extremity of it. Yes. I think, you know, it's, it's hard to be in that place, you know, constantly. I think, you know, I think art if done right is like something welling up from the inside, you know, and it, or it's, 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 it can also be almost uh, like a possession, you know what I mean? So when even, whether it's joy or anger or, or, um, or it's curiosity, like something is, is, is rising. And I think what's, what's the most fun or the most, um, the most gratifying thing about it is just being able to see, to, to understand that what you're, what you're thinking is, is coming across on the page. Yes. Yes. There's this, this deep, there, I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything better for an artist. Yeah. Intensity yes. Yes. It's a full-on experience. Right. Right. A full-on <laughs> immersion. Yeah. And, and exactly. And I think you know too. I think that it, it can be it can be quite dangerous. I think too. There's this aspect of it's like it's 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 like play, but it's like it, it can be also um, playing with fire, <laughs> right? It, this 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 idea that it's like you know. Art, if done right, is like a, it's like a, it's like a monster eating, mm -hmm. eating you. You know what I mean? Eating you from within. So it comes. It, it's like you, you and the, you and this, this sort of. I think that's another thing. Sometimes you do the work, and you, after you're done, you're like, I did that. Like mm -hmm. there's this this moment where you, that moment has passed, and you you're looking at it, and it's this. You have this memory of doing it, but it's almost otherworldly. Other yeah. There's a sense of. of being in that moment of flow. Yes, exactly. Flow. Time. Yes. Time stops. Or it, yeah. It stops. Yeah. And there's. I think what's so freeing about it, whether I'm not a, a painter, but say as a writer. Yeah, you're a writer. writer yes, but you know what? It's like your hand is moving flow, of its own volition. Yeah. That. And it's that wonderful joy of being not self-aware. Yes, that exactly. Freedom. Yes, exactly. And that experience when you're saying when you're looking. Oh, I yeah, because it's completely no fearless, right? Yes. And also, you yes. in in that moment, you've managed to just comp to just express and embody what you what you mean to say, or that that instant itself. Like you become you become joy, or you become mm -hmm. yeah, or yes. you or you become yes. that thing, right? Yes. And the, very much, I mean, I think art has to be imbued with that, or writing when 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 it's any good. Art, any art form. Yeah, but. When it's good, you can almost feel like the person talking in your ear, and it's like they're right there, right? Or they're living within within well, you. And the same with paintings. That, 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 as you say, it has that quality that one looks at it and then stops. And right, then right. Stops in your track. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It has that penetrative quality, yes. um, or it, it has that um, also kind of that ability to to. I think it's like the one said the power of suggestion. Mm -hmm. Like after you leave it, there's something about it that is in the back of your mind, yes. and you're just that's thinking true. about it, and you're thinking about it, and you're like, and I think that's always it's the addictive quality of it. I think that's another thing. It's quite it can be that that joy is also quite addictive. I think because when you when it's like when you, you're in the flow, you don't want to stop. And but life goes on. You can't like you can't just be constantly. <laughs> Where you you know you could, but it's just like eventually it's like well I need to eat or I need yes. to you need to do other things. So I think you know it's almost it's 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 so much fun. It's yeah it, that's why it's like children playing because they're so uh, intensely playing that they don't think about anything else, right? And you have to call them out of that state, and then they don't yes. want to leave it. They want to just keep playing. That's what I think in, the, in paintings it's that. It is very palpable, the sense of sincerity, the yes. sense of commitment. Right. And that definitely 
communicates itself. Yeah, and personality. Yes. I think it's it's so funny when you see an art, artist's work and you really see like you know what what's what's at work you know within them mm -hmm. and and what are they obsessed with and and what symbolizes what to them, yes. you know. And and for me, I, I think it it's very much about um, about kind of taking both what the external world gives me and, and then kind of reiterating that, that experience of it for me, like for myself. And, and just how, um, just rem like I, I keep saying, it's like an, ex it's like an exquisite type of, of meditation, right? Because you, cause you, especially living things, like, I, like watching fish, like I love to paint fish because there's something about their movement and the way they are that is so um, poetic and so like abstract. Mm -hmm. They're like little pieces of abstract work and yet they're alive, right? Yes. They, 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 they're sentient at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, and I think also it just comes from upbringing living in Hong Kong, like there was television, you remember that? And you just yes. watch fish swimming on the TV screen. Yes. That was like one of my favorite shows, <laughs> just watching the fish or going to like a restaurant and seeing the fish. Oh, regard, I mean, I guess you're eating it, but that's kind of sad. But, but you, you just become very, even the, the ink. No, I, 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 yeah. I think in Hong Kong, especially with restaurants with the seafood. Right, it's right. The it's part of everyday experience seeing those, isn't it? Yeah, or just that they're so hypnotic. They're so, they're so self-possessed. You know, and they're in their they have this sort of foreign quality because it's sort of the underwater world. Like everyone is 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 fascinated with that, I think, because it's it's something where it's teeming with life, but yet it's 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 not really um, it's sort of hostile to human beings, right? And the and the, the depths of it is very threatening. But at the same time, you have this this complete urge to 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 react to interact with it. Well, like, I suppose it, it's also counterpart is that being in outer space. Yes, 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 which is also amazing. Like I'm, I think that's also where I, I, I love to paint like astrological things as well, like uh, the universe and kind of how we try and con re conceive of the universe yes. and, and that's like the next frontier, really. I mean, we're try still trying to figure yes. that out. Yeah. You booked your flight yet? To Mars, yes. <laughs> Elon Musk, call me. I'm here. Yes, I think, you know, but it, even now, we're, like, we're talking about colonizing space, which mm -hmm. is really going to be strange, isn't it? I think in your lifetime it will happen. I don't know about that. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know Not in my lifetime. I, I don't know if it's a good thing, necessarily, that, you know, well, I, I understand. I think people are looking at, Mar like, Mars, yes. I think, initially. Um, but well, because it can sustain life. Yes. Yes. The tech information is so much more accessible. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of devalues it in a way. And at the same time, there's 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 so much information available that there's no way to sort through it and know what's meaningful. And and that's why developing, especially in children, critical awareness, right, critical right. capacity will right. will become more and more important. Yeah. And, yes. And, also, just you know, amount of, of does this technology encourage us to not think of ourselves as special, mm. you know, or does it allow us to to even just be more so individualistic that we don't need anybody else mm. because mm -hmm. every because everything is is catered just to our our interests and, yeah, and, yes. and, and interests yes. yes and I think like how do we communicate effectively because mm -hmm. um, so I think. That's one aspect of the show, like for, for me, is kind of questioning can I communicate my art through, through different technological mediums? Mm -hmm. and, and also, um, is there certain things that can, that can remain true, that, mm -hmm. can, remain, that can, can be relevant, eternally mm -hmm. relevant? And mm -hmm. I think most of the time with art, we say yes, but we also know mm -hmm. that it's a product of its time. Yes. Um, and then we, we, we kind of, of course, nothing is above critique. So we, mm -hmm. so when we mm -hmm. look at something, we, if you take some a classical notion of what what a landscape is or what a what a portrait is, um, how do we contemporize it mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. referring back to the whole history of history? The, yes, yeah, yes. And, and also so our kind of a cultural heritage, heritage. <laughs> because there was even this discussion: can a robot be an artist? And um, I would say, well, a robot lacks any selfhood. It lacks, 
a heritage, right? It, it's and then eventually, I think the biggest discussion is can it develop free will? Yes, exactly, because it's only programmed, right? It, 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 can, it can execute something, but it can't, it has no justification mm -hmm. for itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at the same time, like, can it make anything meaningful to human beings because it shares in no part of the human experience? Like, even an animal who paints. Li is born, lives, it has some emotions, right? It, it I'm thinking of those horror, uh, what comes to mind are those awful images, to me awful, like <laughs> yeah. elephants, because yes. elephants are so intelligent. Yes, they're, they're, they're very human-like, yeah. They're very human-like. They mourn, and yeah. They do, they do. Um, and they go back to the place they were born to die. Yes. But we've seen, especially in Asia, images of elephants that are taught to paint. Yeah, and it's a trick, and I, I think that's another thing that we have to acknowledge why there's no such thing as an animal artist. They don't do this naturally. It's a trained yes. trick, honestly, and, and that, these, that the elephants wouldn't, wouldn't need to express themselves this way. This, that art is a truly human thing. Well, it's, as you've expressed so eloquently today. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much for talking to me. It's been a great honor. Thank you. Thank you. We should do it again. Yes, let's do it all every day. Let's do it all the time. You're like, no, I think this is enough. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you.